Hello, hello, welcome everyone. We will get started in just a little bit. We're really excited to have you here tonight. We're just waiting for everyone to join us. All right. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Okay, we are going to get going. So welcome to our third presentation in the Zero Waste Goshen webinar series. We're really, really excited for tonight. Um, tonight is going to be a conversation with J.B. McKinnon, who is the author of The Day the World Stopped Shopping, How Ending Consumerism Saves the Environment and Ourselves. Uh, before we start our conversation with JB, first, um, we're going to have members of the Department of Environmental Resilience with the City of Goshen share a little bit more about uh, the Zero Waste Goshen Initiative. So I'll hand it over to you all. Thanks, Christy. Um, I'm Aaron Swatsky Kingsley. I'm the Director of the Department of Environmental Resilience for the City of Goshen. Um, yes, welcome to all of you who are joining us tonight uh, and anybody who joins us uh, on the, for the recording. Um, the, the Zero Waste Goshen Initiative is something that our department uh, is, is, um, is, is created for residents of Goshen to participate in. Actually, it would be available to anybody to participate, although you wouldn't be able to participate as a Goshenite, as a Goshen resident. Um, the library has been a great partner with us. The, the Goshen Public Library has been a great uh, partner with us on this too. But basically the, the initiative, the Zero Waste Goshen Initiative is uh, designed to help us all think about um, our consumption habits and our, our waste, our solid waste habits. Um, one of the primary things that we have been tracking uh, in Goshen is the way that we are producing more and more waste and paying more and more money to deal with that, spending more and more money to deal with it, um, which is, um, I mean, that is essentially, that's the definition of unsustainable. Um, the more we throw away, the more we pay for it. Why in the world would we do that? Um, so you can, you can join the uh, Zero Waste Goshen Initiative uh, by going to the city website, goshenindiana.org um, and uh, finding, uh, finding our uh, environmental resilience webpage and the zero waste uh, uh, chapter there. And, and you can, can join our initiative and um, uh, learn more about how to reduce our consumption and, and the benefits of doing so. Um, I want to give props to Teresa Saylor, uh, who has done a lot of, uh, if not all of the background work on putting this initiative together, um, and, and a lot of the webinar work here too, along with Christy at, at Goshen Public Library. So again, welcome to everybody. I'll turn it back over to you, Christy, and um, we're glad that everybody's joined. All right, thank you, Aaron. As I mentioned earlier, we have author and journalist J.B. McKinnon with us tonight um, to speak about his book or have a conversation about his book, uh, The Day the World Stopped Shopping. And so just to give you a little background about J.B., as I mentioned, he is an author and a journalist. Um, he has five nonfiction works that he has authored or co-authored. Um, he is an award-winning journalist. He's had publications in The New Yorker, National Geographic, The Atlantic. He is also um, a professor at the University of British Columbia, where he teaches featured writing. Um, and his book that we're discussing tonight and talking about is more of a thought experiment of really looking at how we purchase and consume in our world and the impact that it has on our environment. A uh, fun fact about this book, and JB, please correct me if I say this misspeak any of these. Um, it was a finalist for Best in Business Book Award from the Business 
editing and are from the Society of Business and Editing. So, so that is a fun way to look at that. Um, as we're going, if you have questions for JB, please put them in the chat below. We'll keep an eye on that and be asking those um, as, as we get going with our conversation. So welcome, JB. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, to get us started, could you give us just a little, little bit of a background of, of why you chose this topic to focus on with this book? Sure. First, let, just let me say uh, thank you, Christy, uh, for inviting me to come and talk to, to Goshen, even in this virtual format, and, uh, and to Aaron. And really interesting to hear what's, what's going on in Goshen as well. To dive into your question, um, what got me going in this direction to, towards writing this book was the fact that over really the past couple of decades, I've been mainly writing about environmental issues, broadly speaking. And what I began to realize was that when I thought about what the cause of those environmental problems was, it almost always came down to, uh, to consumption and to how much we consume. Uh, it didn't seem to really matter which issue I was looking at. It could be species extinction, it could be climate change, <clears throat> it could be deforestation. Um, it was really starting to seem like, you know, consumption was the big driver behind all of these things. And if that was the case, I was really wondering why we weren't talking about that. Uh, it seems like we tend to look at things from a um, we kind of look at shallower causes for the problems rather than deeper causes. So for example, with climate change, we'll say, you know, we, uh, we got to stop burning fossil fuels, you know, but why are we burning fossil fuels? We're burning fossil fuels for the most part um, through our acts of consumption or to produce the products that we consume. Um, so, you know, I thought, well, it's, it's probably time we start looking at these root causes. No, oh, great. Thank you. Um, as you know, you were pulling this this book and researching this book. What what were some of your findings that were most surprising for you? I think probably the first finding that was really surprising to me was just that I was right that <laughs> that it, it didn't just seem like consumption was a big driver of environmental crises. It um, the UN panel that studies global natural resources back in 2019 reported that that, that was the case, that uh, how much we consume is now a bigger driver of environmental problems than even than the growth of the human population. So I think for a long, I think a lot of people think that that if you go down to root causes, the big one is just the growth of the human population around the world. But actually at this point, how much each one of us consumes matters more how many of us there are and um that um you know that was quite surprising to to realize that it you know had reached that point and in fact reached that point around the turn of the 21st century so 20 years ago now um other things that surprised me well i mean i was really surprised just at how uh how complicated <laughs> consumption is and how dependent we are on it so and, you know, at this point in history, I remember, and in fact, I write in the book about how after 9-11, uh, George W. Bush, you know, implied and then later said in a very direct manner that people, you know, a response to those attacks uh, was that Americans should go shopping, essentially. And I remember people being really shocked by that comment, myself included, and thinking that's a you know, that seemed like such a, a trivial kind of response to such a dramatic incident. And then, you know, since then, I think we've all kind of realized that, that however tone deaf that comment might have seemed, um, Bush wasn't wrong. Uh, you know, if we all stop, if we all slow down our consumption, it has, you know, really serious and immediate effects on, on uh, the economy. So it it really made clear that we're caught in this dilemma where the planet really seems to need us to slow down our consumption. And yet we've designed the economy in such a way that we have to, we literally have to consume more and more every year, or we slip into, you know, all of the problems of recessions. And 
Definitely. Yeah. I think kind of along, along those lines too, when you um, were interview, uh, interviewing um, Dillinger, one of the things that he mentioned is, you know, if people stop for a week, that won't have an impact on our industry. But if for a month, if people stop shopping, that, that'll have an impact. And so just kind of looking at these relationships that we've all put ourselves in and kind of how to take them apart with one another too so yeah no i mean it is so extraordinary um the the person you're mentioning is paul yeah paul dillinger who's a, a vice president at levi's the jeans makers and and yeah he he was good enough to sit down with me and actually play out this thought experiment that i'm running in the book uh so in the book i just imagine that that consumer spending has stopped uh, or has slowed by about 25% overnight and play out what happens as a way to kind of explore this, this dilemma that we seem to be caught in. So yeah, Paul Dellinger at Levi's was, was good enough to sit down with me and um, run out that scenario from his company's perspective. And it is pretty incredible that, you know, if we stop buying jeans in, in the United States, then uh, or in Canada where I live, then the effects of that will ripple out around the world. I mean, to, in the case of Levi's, I think it's around 20 different countries. Um, it'll affect just this in, incredibly long chain of different people. Um, the impacts are just really extraordinary. JB, in, in your book, um, you, you identify several different um, places, uh, regions, and in some cases, um, uh, cities or towns, where um, where consumption has been dramatically uh, altered for for one reason or another over the past, um, you know, in, in the past two decades or more. Um, mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit about about some of those places? I'm I'm thinking about Finland. I'm thinking about um, um, one of the Japanese islands, um, mm -hmm. Sado Island. Speak, yeah, yeah, right, right. Could you speak about uh, a little about about one of them, or, or either either both of them, even um, about about what I mean, you, you describe what the setting is like and 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 what it uh, what it was like to encounter people in those in those in those places. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about what it what it felt like to to be in those places and uh, what you encountered. Sure, yeah. Um, I took a trip to, I'll start with Finland. So I, I took a trip to Finland because it is the you know, sort of wealthy, modern democratic state that has taken the biggest hit in terms of its consumption in recent history. So, well, relatively recent history in, um, in the 1990s, Finland had uh, what's known as the Finnish Depression. So there were there were uh, recessions in a lot of countries around the world at that time, but Finland's was compounded by the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was, I think, its biggest, if well, if not its biggest, and certainly one of its biggest trading partners. And it had this uh, really tremendous uh, economic crash, and and people stopped buying things, uh, and that compounded the problem. What I think is really interesting about the Finnish experience is that, you know, they didn't have they didn't have riots in the streets, and they didn't have, um, you know, they didn't have massive protests uh, even, because it's a you know that's a nation and a government that acts pretty quickly to try to make sure that um, you know people are taken care of, and a really important cultural quality in Finland is that, uh, that there isn't, that society doesn't develop a sense that some people are way out ahead of other people. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're, you know, they're more active, obviously, over there about uh, the redistribution of wealth uh, in a more equal manner than, than countries like uh, the United States or, or, uh, or even Canada, which is a little bit more that way. But, um, so that was really interesting to see that you can take such a dramatic hit and and it is manageable you know it is something that a society can can move through and uh, make decisions around and adapt to and since then of course finland has come out of that 
uh, you know, and they're more like a, they're back to being a, a wealthy, um, you know, a wealthy modern nation, but they remain cautious because of that experience. They're still, you know, they still uh, maintain this kind of cultural reinforcement of the idea that they don't want, they don't want their economy to, to, uh, to turn into a bubble. You know, they're, they're really cautious about that after, after their own experience. Um, because yeah, the, the other part of the reason that their economy crashed is because leading up to the recessions in the nineties and the collapse of the Soviet economy, uh, this is an important point that I nearly forgot, but in the 1980s, um, the Finnish economy went through a crazy bubble, unlike anything it had seen before. And, uh, and it was seeing a real widening of the gap between rich and poor. Um, and it was seeing its economy turn into an economy driven on speculation, real estate prices shot through the roof, things like that. So uh, things that, you know, we, we've seen quite a bit in the last, uh, last 10, 20 years played out there and then really collapsed. And they've come out the other side of it with, with some interesting things that they've learned. Uh, Sato Island is an island in Japan, uh, quite a large island, but um, I went there because Sato Island is experiencing depopulation. In fact, all of Japan is experiencing depopulation. And an outcome, an, essentially a natural outcome, an unavoidable outcome of depopulation is that your economy struggles to grow because they're, you're losing consumers. <laughs> so um, I went to kind of see how they were adapting to that. And Sato Island is a place that uh, in the past has been quite wealthy. It had a very large gold mine early in its history that was important uh, throughout Asia. And uh, more recently, it became a very popular tourist destination for Japanese. It's not that hard to get to from Tokyo. And then it began to undergo this, uh, this dramatic depopulation. It's lost about 50% of its population now. And again, it's, it's uh, so if you think of that as losing 50% of your consumption, I think we would generally expect that would mean just a tremendous disaster. But Sato Island is adapting and, you know, they've recognized that uh, people's, they've recognized that their economy is not going to grow. And so they actually had a, you know, an island-wide conversation about what they wanted the smaller economy to do, what its priorities should be. And they settled on things like protecting their environment, restoring their uh, important architectural heritage, and taking care of the elderly. Um, and care in general, they decided was going to be their, you know, one of their big priorities. And so it's really interesting to see what can happen when people set aside that, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that, <laughs> that uh, growth is a, you know, is kind of an American obsession, particularly when it comes to, uh, to the governing parties. And to see what happens when that, uh, when that obsession is set aside, and you can start to focus on other priorities is, is quite interesting. Thank you, JB. Um, since, since we're discussing places, you know, you just talked about Japan and Finland, um, somewhere closer to us shows up in the book briefly and, and you discuss Elkhart. Could you maybe speak a little bit more about how Elkhart became part of this book and how it evolved through the writing process? Yeah, um, yeah, Elkhart, I, I realized uh, after I was invited to talk to Goshen that I was like, well, why does that name sound so familiar? And it's because I'd been looking pretty closely at, uh, at Elkhart and the, and the RV manufacturing industry, because one thing I wanted to look at was, well, if we slow down consumption, then, then what do people tend to give up first? And what do people hang on to longest when it comes to consumption? And for a while, it seemed like there was a really clear answer, which is that people give up RVs first. And I, I think uh, you know, people in Goshen and Elkhart know that a lot better than anybody else. Um, the, I mean, the, the stat that stands out to me was that at the start of the Great Recession, 
um, before, really before anybody in the media or even the government, I think, had any real idea that the recession had begun, RV sales in Elkhart dropped by 80% in one week. And that was pretty clearly the, the canary in the gold mine at, at that point. So um, yeah, I mean, the area that you live in has seen these really dramatic shifts in, in consumer priorities. But then uh, in the pandemic, it, it just was all completely haywire. So <laughs> normally, um, you know, everything that was normally supposed to happen didn't happen. So uh, normally, if people slow down their consumption, then RVs are exactly the kind of thing they give up. It's sort of a big ticket item that's also a luxury. And uh, but in the pandemic, people interpreted the situation totally differently. And it was, I don't know, kind of a good lesson for me because, uh, you know, really something that was driven home for me in the research for this book is that consumption is really personal and individual and that uh, something that seems like a luxury one week might seem like a, an absolute necessity three weeks later. And what might seem like a total luxury to one person might be a, a you know an absolute essential to another person. Um, there's actually a joke in the book about on against myself in this regard, where I, uh, I just mentioned in passing in a list of things that I'm hoping people will think of as kind of useless items, robotic cat litter boxes. And uh, so I popped that in there because I, I remember reading about robotic cat litter boxes and kind of going like, ah, oh, this is exactly the kind of you know garbage that you know why is it why why was it even invented? Then my uh, my mom developed dementia and she has a cat, and we bought a robotic cat litter box so that you know because uh, she was forgetting to clean the cat litter box. So it was just a real lesson to me that uh, you know even some of the crazier things that are out there might have some purpose. It's just that ultimately, you know, we're, we're, as a whole, we're consuming too many things, period. Um, and, you know, consuming it at, uh, at an unsustainable level. But, but I'm, I'm not going to judge anybody for the robotic cat litter box anymore, that's for sure. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were talking more about um, individual choice. And so oftentimes when we are behind the scenes planning um, zero waste Goshen, you know, sometimes our conversations are like, oh, I'm so, so overwhelmed, you know, where do I even start? And you mentioned a, a little bit about how, you know, our individual choices may change or need. Um, are there any other ways that you would kind of discuss or recommend looking at individual consumerism or how it impacts everything on the whole? Yeah, I mean, something that I took away from this book pretty clearly is that um, I do think that that individuals, it's important for individuals to engage with these issues and to and to become, I think it's important to be a, a thoughtful consumer. Um, and it's important because it, it does send a signal out to uh, the companies that produce the things that we use that um, you know that that we care that we care about how things are manufactured i also think it's satisfying to to live close to your values i think that most people don't like to think that they're buying things um, from people who aren't being paid a living wage or don't want to buy things that are causing really clear environmental harms we don't always have the energy to research those things and figure out what what they are and sometimes we just grab something off the shelf and buy it but but it's still important i think to you know to keep trying to become a more conscious uh, a more conscious consumer because it does have big impacts but all of that said one thing i found was that there is this pattern through history where our interest in reducing consumption kind of pops up and it, it waxes and wanes we can say that so even in relatively recent history in the 1960s uh, the hippie movement had a message of simplify your life at least some of the hippies did in the 1970s you had the first wave of the environmental movement and they were very much uh, calling for a less is more sort of approach to, to life in the 1990s there was the voluntary simplicity and the downshifting 
movements where people, you know, quite a significant number of Americans were, were actually uh, choosing to work less in order to, you know, uh, regain life balance. And, and since they were choosing to work less, they were also, uh, by necessity, consuming less and, and really embracing that. Um, it hasn't really been a movement along those lines since then. But looking back through history, you see that these things, they flare up, but they fade away. And I think it's because it's very difficult for individuals to sustain uh, a reduction. Like if people choose to live simply, I think it's very difficult to sustain that in a society that's a consumer society uh, where we, we mark all our holidays with consumption. We, we signal um, our identities to other people through our consumption. We mark life's milestones through consumption. We, we uh, measure success through consumption. You know, we've built consumption into so much of the way we live that it's very difficult to, to live as an outsider to that. Uh, and so if we want to reduce consumption and have it stick in the long run, individuals are important, but it's, it's even more important to try to transform the system so that it's easier for all of us to consume less. It, it, you know, it really shouldn't just sit on, a, on our individual shoulders. Yeah, thank you. Um, with, with that as well, I think, you know, we're talking about individuals and, and groups and how it's cyclical. Um, part of what we're doing here with the Zero Waste Goshen initiative as well is, is really looking at kind of practical applications of, of, you know, again, it's very individualized, but of things that we can do. So would there be, you know, kind of some general practical applications that, that you could suggest? Yeah, I mean, practical applications to reducing consumption or changing the system or which, which are those you mean? Let's do both. <laughs> Let's do both. Okay, well, so we'll start with individuals and we'll go on to examples at a system scale. Uh, I mean, the approach that I often uh, advocate, you know, coming out of my research for the book and which I've applied to my own consumption coming out of this research is this idea of fewer but better things. Um, so in the case of, well, fewer but better goods, services, consumer experiences, uh, you name it. So if we think about buying clothing, then the idea here would be to buy fewer uh, articles of clothing, but buy better clothing. So things that are going to last longer, that are going to survive through more than one fashion season, you know, that are more durable and less disposable. Uh, because if you, you know, if you own long lasting things, then you don't have to replace them as often and it reduces the amount of consumption uh, that you do. And there's other benefits to that as well. It takes more labor um, to produce a durable product. So uh, you kind of can replace, you know, the idea is that we gradually work towards a model where, uh, at least with durable goods, we're replacing uh, high volume sales of, dis of more and more disposable goods with a lower volume of more durable goods, but we're still getting uh, we're still getting, we're still hanging on to employment because durable goods take more skilled labor, they take more labor period. Um, and then there's also things like maintenance and repair and uh, secondhand sales and things like that, that, that can be done with durable goods. So that's, a, that's an individual approach and you can apply that sort of buy less, buy better approach even to things like travel. Um, you know, I certainly have seen in the pandemic, uh, friends of mine who are fortunate enough to be able to travel a lot, uh, internationally even, and, you know, a lot of those people in the pandemic reflected on that and realized at a certain point, if you're traveling all over the world, you really, you don't even remember some of those trips over time. And they've started to think, well, like you could do fewer trips but trips that where you, you hung around a little longer, maybe you prepared for the trips, learned a bit of the language, you know, some of these some kinds of things and uh, traveled better instead of 
more often. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, you start to see that this kind of approach can result in reducing consumption, but actually increasing your quality of life because it's, it's a pleasure to have high quality goods around you to, to own products that, that don't fall apart. Um, and that s stick with you for, you know, for years of your life and that, you know, you attach stories to and things like that. And it's a pleasure to, to have a bunch of really good memories from your travel rather than uh, not be able to remember which country you were in two years ago, right? So uh, at an individual level, that's a really important way to think about it, I think. In terms of system changes, uh, a really simple example would be um, lifespan labeling on, for example, clothing. So that if I go to a store and I'm looking at one sweater, uh, or I'm looking at two sweaters and one is quite a bit more expensive than the other, then I might look at the label and see, oh, the more expensive sweater is going to last 10 times as long. And uh, so, yeah, you know, we're budget minded human beings and we might do, run the calculations and say it's worth it to buy this longer lasting thing. And certainly I know that I cannot do that by eye. Uh, I've been fooled a few times, <laughs> you know, I'm not intel I'm not well informed enough about how things, how clothing in particular is made to be able to distinguish between something that's going to last a long time and something that isn't. So um, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that a government can mandate or that a company can change and, you know, use as a promise that they make to the, to the customer. And um, that kind of system level change, even at, you know, even that small uh, of a change can start to move us in a different direction around consumption. But if you want to look at a much more sort of uh, big picture kind of change, um, and this one's you know, certainly somewhat controversial, but inequality is a strong driver of consumerism. If you, if you look at countries with larger gaps between rich and poor, um, you'll tend to see that those are also some of the most consumeristic countries. And there's two key psychological reasons for that. One is, one is just the keeping up with the Joneses effect that I think we're all familiar with. Uh, I think the thing is we all like to think it doesn't actually affect us, but the research is pretty clear that it does. You know, we are all, um, we're all very sensitive to uh, the feeling that we might be losing a dignified place in society. And so if we have that feeling that through our possessions or through, you know, what we see others having in terms of their possessions, you know, we are losing that dignified place in society, then we'll consume to, uh, you know, to, to maintain our dignity, which is not an unreasonable thing to do. Um, the other aspect of it is that if you see, if, if you see people with a lot more than you have, it actually just gives you a, a basic sense of material insecurity. You just feel unsafe compared to uh, those people. So you'll tend to consume more for that reason as well. So there's basically like two psychological triggers um, that come out of inequality that, that make us more consumeristic. Um, so addressing inequality is, is an important thing that can be done. And um, you know, the United States is certainly one of the more unequal uh, nations on the planet in terms of wealthier nations, but it also hasn't always been that way through much of the 20th century, the gap between rich and poor was much, much narrower than it is today in the United States. So this, you know, it's quite a, it's a going concern for, uh, for Americans. JB, uh, yeah, thank, thank you for those, uh, those really thoughtful answers. Um, there, there was a question here about transforming the system. What, what does that look like? And, and you've, uh, you've, um, I think you've answered that uh, at least in part. Um, would, as you were talking, I was, I, I was struck. Um, would it be fair um, to, in some ways, simplify um, the idea that uh, one, one way to transform our our, uh, our personal, our individual practices, as well as the system, is, is to focus on the idea of quality over quantity. Is that a, 
I mean, is that a reasonable simplification of the, yeah, of the yeah. dilemma? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you're hitting it right on the head there. I think that, that idea of fewer but better purchases or buy less, buy better, I think quality over quantity is, is the, um, it's kind of the root of all of that, right? It's the idea that we're, we create a, an economy that runs on quality rather than quantity is, is kind of the root of all of that. And again, that's, that's that system level thinking, right? It's, we've really been moving for a long time in the direction of quantity. And uh, the alternative to that is to move in this direction of quality, I think. One of the things that I'm that I'm often struck by here in Goshen, I don't know whether you have these out uh, uh, in British Columbia, but we have some old uh, brick roads, um, you know, that were built during the Depression, um, and uh, here in Goshen, some of them uh, exist even to this day, uh, you know, 80, 90 years later. As, as opposed to um, asphalted roads, you know, that get torn up every 10, 15, 20 years and replaced. Um, the asphalt roads, uh, or the, 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 the brick roads, as well as lasting much longer, are also a, uh, a, a, a permeable pavement, you know, that lets, mm -hmm. that lets water through them in a way that, uh, you know, that, that asphalt doesn't. Uh, it strikes me as, as an example of this idea of quality over quantity in various, uh, in various ways that that can kind of be spun out. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's a great, it's a great point. The, the way things were made in the past, I mean, this seems to be one area where um, so many people come together on this issue. <laughs> I think there's very few people that are really delighted uh, to be moving towards more and more disposable goods. I think most people are frustrated by it to at least some extent. And uh, our, an interesting conversation I had researching the book was with a, a woman who was the director of um, what at the time was America's oldest tool lending library. So uh, just like a library, except you go in there and you can get a, a saw or a, a lawnmower or things like that. Um, you can check those out and then check them back in when you're done. And that had seemed like a really good idea until the modern era, basically, like until recent years. So she said, you know, they used to have lawnmowers that that lasted basically forever. They could lend them out and, you know, hundreds of people could use them hundreds of times and they could sharpen the blades and all of those sorts of things. And uh, and then they started buying, you know, the, the lawnmowers they're buying were getting worse and worse until they got to the point where most of their lawnmowers wouldn't last a season because if you have a bunch of people, you know, borrowing the lawnmower, then, um, then basically it runs out the whole lawnmower's life cycle uh, in a single season of use. And they weren't, their lawnmowers could no longer be repaired. The blades couldn't be sharpened, that kind of thing. So she said, even she's like, I remember saying, I think the quote is in the book, um, a shovel can be sharpened but not if it's made of a material that can't be sharpened. <laughs> so, you know, um, they were buying these plastic snow shovels and, uh, you know, once the edge of those shovels was, was uh, dull, they just had to throw them out. Um, so yeah, durability is a really important, is a really important aspect of it. And, uh, and just this idea of quality overall, the quality of experiences, the quality of the services we use, um, all of those things are are pretty pretty critical to it, to this idea. And I think you're bringing up a great point too. Um, and one of our our panelists behind the scenes mentioned, you know, we might be losing that knowledge of how to fix things, and that seems like it falls in to the being able to consume less. So, did you find that idea of, of of learning how to fix things or bringing back those skills coming up through any of your research or your findings? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point that we have, most of us have lost a lot of those skills. And, uh, um, but I mean, I think economies are really adaptable. I think that's one thing that we learned in the pandemic that, that was really interesting was, was just how quickly kind of the whole system could, could shift on its heels and move in a bit different direction. And, 
So you see things like Europe. Um, I mean, President Biden has mentioned this idea of a, of a right to repair, which would mandate that, um, that companies make certain products in such a way that they can be repaired. And um, Europe is moving in that direction. And so, you know, what happens really quickly then is that uh, people see an opportunity to create a new sector in the economy of repair and maintenance. And uh, um, I mean, if we need to do it, then, you know, uh, colleges will start to see that there's an advantage in teaching people how to repair things, um, teaching, training people to move into the repair and maintenance trade. And pretty soon, yeah, you have an expansion of a sector of the economy that right now is tiny, which is repair, you know, the repair and maintenance. Um, there's just not that much going on in that field at the moment. Um, but there were times historically when these things were much more in balance. I mean, historically, there would have been um, you know, times when quite a few American shops would have been selling both new goods and used goods. And there was certainly a much larger repair you know, repair and maintenance was a much larger part of the economy in the past than it is today, but could be again in the future. Thank you. Um, so we are around uh, 7 11 right now, and we, we have a little bit more time left. Um, again, just as a reminder for anyone in the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we, we will answer those for you. Um, with this too, and this is this is kind of me being the librarian in the group, your book serves as a great starting point of, of really looking at consumerism in this lens and the impact it has on the environment. Are there other books or authors that really inspire you to continue your research and your findings? Uh, in this, this particular field? Mm -hmm. um, no, you know, the, this field's pretty bare. <laughs> um, there, there's a bunch of books that I mentioned in, in the back of the book, um, but really it's like a collection of books from, from you know, 20 years ago. Um, as I say, I mean, the idea of reducing consum consumerism rather than just uh, trying to reduce the impacts of consumerism hasn't been a, a central part of the public conversation for, yeah, for 20, 25 years. Um, but I think what's, what is, um, Good to see is that I there's certainly a lot more writing emerging about it. Uh, there have been articles just in the last little while in in the New York Times, and uh, yeah, I just did an interview with with uh, somebody writing for the CNN webs. There seems to be there seems to be a lot of people who are starting to talk about this subject again. Um, but actually, you know, I, I don't know of other books that have come out recently that are that are really in depth on this topic. There are, of course, some books around um, minimalism and sort of living uh, with fewer possessions. Uh, there's certainly things that are kind of tied into it, but but um, yeah, I'm sure there will be more soon. <laughs> you tell me you're you're a librarian you keep an eye out <laughs> i know yeah and i mean our reference department is fantastic so anyone in the audience too contact our reference department as well and i think too um just kind of listening to you answer that question it, it's very true what you were speaking about earlier with everything being cyclical so we're we're coming back into one of those cycles in which it's really being examined and so it'll be it'll be fun to see what emerges in terms of writing with that so yeah i mean and i mean those old those older books are great uh to read books like uh voluntary simplicity by uh duane elgin and uh um what are some of the i'm kind of blanking on some of the others now but uh um yeah they're all in the uh you yeah, know i've got some some lists in the back of the book under sourcing that that talk about some of these books that emerged in the late 80s and 90s um, and I mean, those, those lessons haven't really changed. I mean, the message of how to develop a satisfying life at a lower level of consumption are, are still pretty much the same. It's, you know, you invest in what psychologists call uh, intrinsically satisfying activities. So these are things that are, uh, that just, you know, we don't really know why, but 
they make us feel good. And that's things like, uh, you know, building strong relationships with people we care about, uh, connecting to the natural world, um, mastering new skills, uh, or even, you know, mastering skills that we currently have that we haven't really mastered. Uh, it, engaging with issues that are larger than ourselves is a big one. So getting involved in our community or uh, volunteering, um, becoming active on big issues that you that you care about. These are, you know, these are all things that are known to provide a greater level of life satisfaction than consumption does. Um, and we we just right now, I think most of us feel like we don't have time to to invest in those uh, in those that alternative set of values. But they are uh, they really do seem to be a meaningful path to to life satisfaction with a you know with a much lower consumer impact. JB, um, you you just uh, you just mentioned time. Um, <laughs> And so I, I wondered if you could uh, talk a little bit about about the connection between uh, consuming consumerism and pace of life, and, and in particular, slowing down. Yeah, no, it's such an important question, and um, time is a really interesting factor in all of this because many people probably who are um, here here tonight um, will remember. When there were when there were Sunday closures of of commerce, you know, basically Sabbaths where you you know on Sundays you wouldn't be able to buy much of anything, and it isn't so much that that resulted in lower consumption because people were able to shop all the other six days of the week, but what it resulted in was a a weekly break from the consumer mindset and. That was, I think, in retrospect, really, really important, you know, for us to to have a day, or or any time at all, when we were turned off from from consumption and commerce, and um, that's completely gone now, of course, because we shop seven days a week. Um, more, you know, you can shop on Christmas, you can shop on Thanksgiving Day, you can shop through the holidays, you can shop at night, and on your phone, you can shop anytime you want, anywhere you want. So um, we've completely lost that, that, you know, that different kind of space, a different kind of architecture of time that, um, that allows us to kind of think differently about the world. And that's probably been quite a big loss that we haven't recognized. But the other thing is that, um, yeah, well, when we talk about which values do we pursue in life? Do we pursue these kind of more consumeristic, more materialistic values, or do we pursue these more uh, uh, automatically, more naturally satisfying kind of values that psychologists have identified? It really does just come down to hours in a day. If we're spending most of our time earning income and spending it, it doesn't leave us with very much time to invest in those other those other values. And uh, I think most of us feel like we really need to, to be engaged in, in that earn spend cycle uh, with most of the hours of, of our waking day. If you look at people who've been practicing, um, you know, sort of simpler lifestyles for 20 or 30 years, and I talked to quite a few people who've done that, that's a big difference is that most of them uh, because they don't consume as much, you know, often they consume quite a bit less than the average American. Um, they don't feel like they have to earn as much. That gives them freedom to make different choices about how many hours they work, whether to work part-time or full-time. Um, and they, they seem to have more time. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see that they do invest it in this other set of values. And that's where they derive most of the meaning in their lives. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite striking if you talk to a bunch of those kinds of people compared to uh, everyday everyday folks, um, there's a distinct difference there. So JB, I have another question coming in on my end. Um, 
but how have you seen your work? How has it changed you in your life? I think the main change for me is in that last point. Um, I think that because I'm a, you know, I write about the environment and I was concerned about environmental impacts. I, you know, I was trying to reduce my consumption, but I was reducing it by giving things up and I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't really gaining much <laughs> except maybe, you know, a feeling that I was doing good in the world. Um, but um, what I've started to do since writing this book is more actively concentrate on that, that other set of values. And so rather than seeing reducing consumption as just a process of losing things, you know, I, I see it as, uh, as making changes that, that allow me to, to gain things. So gaining time um, and investing my time differently into, uh, into things that I value. And yeah, I mean, it's, it really has felt to me like the missing piece in the puzzle. Um, I, I, I'm not always at it. I'm, you know, I get caught up in absolute busyness, uh, you know, pretty often, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I'm getting, you know, I'm, I am focused on, uh, you know, trying to move in that direction. And when I'm succeeding at it, I can see very clearly that, that it is, uh, that the promise is quite real, that your quality of life can improve your sense that that you're living well can improve uh, while you reduce your consumption um, substantially. And that's, you know, that's, uh, that to me is, is, you know, I, I don't think we'll be able to do it any other way. I mean, I don't think we want to get to a place where we just have to give it, give it all up. I think that'd be pretty feel painful. It's, uh, you know, be much more likely to succeed if we can do this in a way that, uh, that makes it feel as though we're all we're all benefiting. No, thank you. Um, I'm getting I'm getting a couple other <laughs> questions coming my way. So thank you for your patience. Um, so we were talking about the right to repair, right? And with the regula regulations that would prohibit manufacturer policies from barring the repair of equipment and devices by individuals in independent repair shops. Have you heard about this at all? Um, do you think this could have a larger impact on our consumption practices? Uh, have I heard about right to repair like happening? You mean? Um, that and, and possibly any regulations or policies that are coming through from manufacturers in terms of, of repairing items and things like that. I think all of the best examples right now are in Europe. Um, Europe, this is, a, this is a pretty hot topic, actually. And I think we're definitely going to be seeing uh, forms like legislation around right to repair emerging and being, being put in place in countries in Europe. But one, one real quick example is a there's a company in Europe called Fairphone, and it produces modular phones. So if you, you know, instead of having to update your phone, you could just look at what features you want to update. Say you say it's really important to you to have the most updated camera. You don't need to buy a new Fairphone. You would just uh, uh, open up your Fairphone, and you can do this yourself. <laughs> uh, pop out the camera, pop in the new camera, close up your Fairphone, and ta-da, you have an updated camera in your phone. Um, I was at the Fairphone offices, which are in uh, Amsterdam, and uh, he you know, showed me how to change the, the headphone jack in a Fairphone. And on my first try, I was able to do it in, in about two minutes myself. Very straightforward. And he could do it in about 30 seconds. So. Um, you know, we, you can't, but Fairphone isn't designed to work in North America yet, but, uh, um, you know, it was a really clear example of a way that rather than, rather than having to update by just disposing of our phones, we can update them, you know, in this completely different way. Fairphones are so easy to repair, um, that it's kind of shocking that, you know, that, they, that all phones aren't made this way and offered to us in this manner. So, um, particularly, you know, given you know, given the the environmental costs of 
producing a phone. So um, yeah, you do start to see these these uh, these types of things emerging for sure. JB, with with that with those comments, um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between technology and and consumption? Um, you, you you've given a wonderful example of technology that that can be modular that um, that sounds like it can be accessible. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that here we are um, giving our time to this important conversation via, via technologies that allow us to do it. But, but we're, we're, uh, we're also taking time, you know, from other, other important things. My family's having supper right now, <laughs> um, you know, but this is important to me. So here I am, but it's all because the technology exists to do this. And there, and there, I think many of us probably feel a, a compulsion to, to enter the technology, to follow the technology. It's kind of a taboo thing maybe to, to consider, but um, you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think there are technology. I mean, I think the, the wisest minds that I've read on the topic, you know, they, they just think technology is a, it's a tool, right? It can be used well, it can be used poorly. Um, well, how, what determines whether it's used well or poorly? I think culture determines whether it's used well or poorly. So a culture like ours uh, in which, for example, competition around ownership of possessions and competition around social status is so important is almost bound to use technology poorly, <laughs> because as you say, I mean, a new technology will be invented. You might never have thought that you wanted a pair of virtual reality goggles, but if everybody's getting virtual reality goggles and, you know, they're starting to use them in the classroom and um, it's the only way to watch, you know, the latest TV program that everybody's talking about, um, it has, you know, the, if the technology develops real social currency, then most of us are, are going to drift in that direction and get some virtual reality goggles, even though our starting point was never having imagined that that was something that we cared about. Um, you know, other, other, uh, you know, other cultures um, have been and some still are much more selective about what technology they, they adopt and, and uh, consider to be valuable. So I think there's... Um, again, it's probably, a, you know, an important question of balance and one that we're not, you know, we're not doing a great job with in terms of uh, a balanced approach, I don't think. Um, and one example, just really quickly on that is, you know, is this idea that we can, we can tech our way out of climate change, for example. So um, a great, a great example from the book, um, speaking of things that maybe surprised me when I wrote this, <laughs> I looked at this program in Japan called Top Runner, and it was uh, a program to try to pursue energy efficiency in appliances. So things like air, air conditioners, televisions, and refrigerators. And it was really successful. Uh, I think they managed to, to get a 70% reduction in energy use in those appliances, in, in those household appliances in Japan. Um, and then they looked at household energy use and they thought, well, definitely it's going to have dropped because everybody's using energy efficiency appliances now. And in fact, it had gone up. Um, so a couple of researchers went and looked at why this would be the case. And what they realized was that people thought, okay, my appliances are going to consume less energy. I'm going to save money on my energy bill. I'm going to spend that money. And one of the things they spent it on was exactly those same appliances. So people were buying more, they were buying extra air conditioners. They were buying bigger televisions. They were buying more televisions. They were buying the largest refrigerators on the market. So, you know, this attempt to um, use energy efficiency to solve the problem ended up being caught up in the consumer mindset and kind of, uh, you know, got a, got a judo flip <laughs> and, uh, and ended up in the wrong place. Uh, so, yeah, I think that really clearly shows that uh, you know, technology alone can't do it. We need to shift culture as well. No, thank you so much, JB, for that. Well, we are just coming up on 7.30 right now. Um, again, thank you for your time and sharing your insights. I, speaking for myself, 
you've you've given me a lot to walk away and think about now um and i really appreciate that um everyone who joined us thank you so much for for taking part tonight um keep a lookout on the zero waste ocean website uh, we will announce our upcoming speakers uh that will be starting up again in january of 2022 so thank you so much for joining us and have a great night thanks so much thanks so much thanks davy